It is Wednesday, September the 2nd, 2020. I am talking to someone uh, who I will say I'm actually a fan of his work. And I actually became aware of you through two different historians, two people who I generally uh, trust as sources of quality information. Uh, two people have actually been a part of their projects, or, or at least one of which have been, they've been a pro- part of mine. That would be uh, Mr. Kevin Cruz out of Princeton University. Uh, the other is Dr. Carrie Lee Merritt here in Atlanta. Um, they both uh, speak good about you. They speak really highly about you. And your Twitter feed is amazing. It's always a constant uh, a constant update of just good quality information. So I'm talking to a uh, historian, uh, Kevin. Uh, um, gosh, I, I keep wanting to say it incorrectly, but Levin. And so in my, I'm from the South, so I always want to say Levine. Like, I know that's not your last name, but it's Levin. And so uh, for you all who don't know who he is, he is honestly one of the best sources that you could talk to about Civil War, Civil War memory, um, Confederate statues, monuments. And so for a lot of people who've read my newsletter or you read some of my work, you know that I've mentioned earlier this year about the role of memorial societies and what they had on Confederate monuments here in Atlanta in particular. And so now to have someone like uh, Kevin to come in and talk about all of these things is a real treat. And so he writes for the Atlantic as well, or at least you contribute to the Atlantic as well. And so I really cannot say enough good things about this particular person. So he's a wealth of knowledge. We're just going to get straight into it. Awesome. Um, and I just want people to know first, Kevin, how would you um, uh, introduce your, or how would you think about yourself? Because I know we talked about this offline, but I think you've done so much. It's interesting to hear how you see yourself. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, everyone's going back into the classroom this year. I'm a 20 year plus high school teacher, history teacher, and unfortunately I'm not teaching this year. I'm going to miss it. But I think of myself first and foremost as a high school history teacher. And, you know, I've had the opportunity over the last, well, close to 20 years now. Um, I've had the opportunity because of a very successful blog that I started back in um, 2005 I've had the opportunity to do uh, writing on the side, write a couple books, work with um, teachers uh, in professional development programs, uh, lead tours, history tours, do a lot of things. And so I'm, I'm really sort of, um, sort of blessed to be able to do a lot of that stuff beyond teaching. But I think of myself first and foremost as a, as a history teacher. Okay. And so I want to bring that up because right now in particular, this is one of the bigger years for the conversation on both Confederate monuments and and Confederate statues. And so I want to just jump straight into that, if you don't mind, oh, which yeah. is, can you explain to people why we even have Confederate monuments and Confederate statues? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, um, <laughs> I can give you the long answer or the relatively short answer. Um, you know, I think probably the, the most significant reason we have Confederate monuments is just the significance of the, of the Civil War itself, um, the significance that white Southerners, Confederate, uh, Confederates who were, were white Southerners who fought in the war in the 1860s, um, the next generations that followed, uh, I think it has a lot to do with the significance that they attach to uh, the experience of the war, especially defeat, right? I think the Confederate monuments um, reflect the fact of Confederate defeat and the attempt after 1865 to try to make sense of that defeat and to try to um, weave out of defeat some understanding uh, of um, success, some understanding or some interpretation uh, of victory that they could pull out of it. And Southerners, white Southerners, you know, uh, sort of fashioned this, what we call lost cause narrative of the war that highlighted the bravery of the soldiers, the rank and file, highlighted the Christian um, values of their top generals, um, denied that slavery was the central, central cause of the war. And in the decades after the war, um, you know, you start to see a Southern landscape that becomes littered with Confederate monuments. Um, I, again, as a way to um, save some kind of um, positive or make some kind of positive spin about what the war was about. And also as a symbol of their success in regaining control of state governments after Reconstruction. Those monuments, you hear a lot of people make the connection with the Jim Crow era, and that's when most of them did go up. Uh, But those monuments also reflect just the fact of a uh, Southern resurgence, white Southern resurgence, 
uh, or a redemption and regaining of control of those state and local governments. And I'm, I'm glad that you gave a full context on that because one of the things I've gotten a lot this summer across the border, across the, the racial demographic spectrum from people is that people say, hey, King, so maybe that was a long time ago. Maybe that's not important. Or, you know, why do we even have Confederate statues in, in the first place? And so I think that's a really good primer as to why we even have them because a lot of people it's just a statue right it doesn't mean anything and so i gotta ask you uh because i know your twitter feed has been very busy in this particular topic which is what is in your opinion society's view of confederate monuments today as of september 2020 do you think it's more in support of do you think it's more people finally starting to learn about the history or do you think more people are, are you know I think it's hard to gauge just what percentage of the country is actually invested in this uh, question of, of what these monuments mean, whether or not they should remain in public spaces. I think, it, I think the, the debate certainly has been heightened over the last five years, uh, especially given or going back to the, the murders committed by Dylan Roof in South Carolina in June of 2015. And then, of course, what's happened since. You have Charlottesville in August of 2017. And then of course you have, um, you know, the police killing of George Floyd back in late May of this year. Uh, And I think the the connection, I think certainly the focus has been um, heightened because of the the racial, ongoing racial problems in the country. Um, The recognition that these monuments um, are part of understanding the long history of this racial divide in the country. And one of the things I'm fascinated about um, is the ways in which these monuments have always sort of functioned to maintain um, white supremacy or a racialized landscape. Um, You know, these monuments didn't go up in just any random place in local communities. They went up in some of the most prominent places in our in our towns and cities, uh, local parks, popular intersections, uh, courthouse squares. And, you know, they dominate these landscapes. And I think in doing so, have always served as a reminder of who is a full citizen or or is thought of as a full citizen and who is uh, considered to be a second-class citizen. And I think um, that is in large part what people are responding to um, over the last few years. And I think they're going to remain divisive uh, moving forward. Right. And one of the things that's been very divisive almost from, I'm not going to say from the beginning, for a very long time now, for decades, is the stars and bars of the Confederate flag. Uh, we've seen a couple of things happen recently about it. Mississippi um, has decided this year to finally do away with the Confederate flag after decades of having it. The state of Georgia now is the only one that has the Confederate flag still up, and it's, the ori- it's closer to the original Confederate flag than yeah, the stars and bars. Yeah, the first nationally, right, exactly. Right. And so I want to actually talk to you about that because I think you could really explain to people what the Confederate flag actually is and then the stars and bars and kind of how we even get to this place where we are today. Well, I mean, yeah, the flag, the flag discussion is sort of complex because there are so many. Uh, quite often people sort of confuse the Confederate battle flag, the sort of St. Andrew's Cross design mm-hmm. with the stars and bars. But the stars and bars refers to the first national flag that was adopted by the Confederacy in 1861. Um, red and, uh, it had a sort of a, a very similar look to the Stars and Stripes. In fact, when it was used in battle in some of the earliest battles, uh, it was confusing to men on both sides. And so by November of 1861, uh, regiments adopted um, the St. Andrew's Cross, a square flag, as their regimental flags, not in all Confederate armies, especially um, you, would, you would have found them in the Army of Northern Virginia, what becomes Robert E. Lee's army. And uh, over time, um, the Confederate national flag uh, goes through some revisions. In fact, by the middle of the war, uh, the national flag would have included uh, the St. Andrew's Cross in the corner uh, on top of an all white field. And later that was amended by the end of the war to a red stripe on the opposite side of the, um, of, of the St. Andrew's cross in that still upper corner. Uh, so the national flags went through some revisions, uh, but usually when we talk about the Confederate flag, um, 
we're talking about the battle flag. And that, of course, is, is the symbol. That's, of course, the symbol that Dylan Roof embraced in 2015. It's what, um, you know, white Southerners embraced, um, you know, as members of the Dixiecrat Party in, the, in 1948, when they bolted from the Democratic Party uh, in opposition to civil rights. And it's, of course, the symbol that um, white Southerners embraced generally as a symbol of massive resistance during the civil rights era. So if you were protesting the integration of colleges and public schools, if you were standing along the Alabama highway as King and, and the other marchers are, are moving from Selma to Montgomery, uh, you would have found the Confederate battle flag being waved as that sort of, um, that, that symbol of resistance against civil rights. And so it has a very long history. I think it's always been, connected in some way to the history of white supremacy. Um, so it's no accident that Dylan Roof would have adopted that flag in 2015. He knew exactly uh, what he was trying to attach himself to in murdering those nine black churchgoers in, in, in Charleston. Right. And one of the things I, I kind of wanted to stay for here for a second, which is you mentioned this notion of resistance. And can you explain to people what that means? Because I think a lot of people kind of gloss over that aspect of why Confederate monuments and the flags keep existing because a lot of people see these as symbols of resistance. Can you explain what that is? Uh, well, I think resistance, the flag, I think, is a symbol of resistance or, or has always been a symbol of resistance, um, you know, again, for white Southerners who are standing up against any attempt to override the right of their state, uh, especially during the Jim Crow era uh, and through the 50s and 60s to um, to sort of give in to civil rights legislation or, or any kind of push from the federal government uh, to, to begin to integrate, especially public spaces. Um, I think the best example of this in terms of connecting the flag to the, the history of, of white resistance to civil rights is, is the story of Will Eccles in Mississippi, who in 1920, 21, uh, was accused of murder in the state of Mississippi. And um, his ex, he was, he was uh, scheduled to be executed and he got a stay of execution. And that didn't sit well for uh, a local white community. And they uh, basically broke him out of jail in the middle of night, took him into the forest, into the woods and, and lynched him. Before they murdered him, however, they forced him to kiss a Confederate battle flag. And so this is in 1920, 1921. And so that's one of, I think, one of the most violent examples of uh, the ways in which white Southerners continue to embrace um, the Confederate flag, um, you know, as, um, as a symbol of resistance. I think today, you know, if, if, if we want to think about Confederate monuments as symbols of resistance, I think, you know, it's easy to attach them, especially when white Americans surround the monuments and are and, and are committed to protecting those monuments. Certainly, I think in many cases we're talking about white Americans who are uh, defensive when it comes to the issue of race, defensive when it comes to acknowledging the importance of Black Lives Matter uh, or any kind of movement to uh, to sort of uh, push for civil rights or even to question the racial status quo. But I think for other people, you know, the monuments or defending the monuments. I know. You know, again, you've already brought this up. Uh, quite often, uh, people do talk about the danger of erasing the past. Now, I don't, I don't believe that removing monuments is necessarily um, tantamount to, to erasing the past. But I do think what we are hearing from people is an, another form of defensiveness, a sense that a kind of understanding of, of American culture, of, of any uh, notion of a historical narrative based on freedom or the, or the perception that the United States is exceptional when it comes to freedom is being undercut, right? And so whether or not they, it could be any kind of monument perhaps, the Confederate monuments are front and center for, for any number of reasons. But I think for many white Americans, um, it's just a sense that, that they feel as if something that they hold as sacred is being undercut. So it, it does certainly, the umbrella includes race, uh, but I think it includes a lot of other things uh, today. If that yeah. makes sense, I hope that no, makes no. sense. <laughs> no, that does make sense. And something, there's something else that you wrote, you actually wrote a book about it, and I want to stick on this for a second because 
it gets into something else that's kind of adjacent to this topic of Confederate monuments and, and the flag is you wrote an entire book on this, which is uh, the notion of like the black Confederate. Right? <laughs> right. And so I don't even want to spoil this. I just want you to talk about your book in particular um, about black Confederates, the image of black Confederacy and things like that. Yeah. yeah thanks. Um, yeah, the, the, it, this was a really interesting book to, to work on because it gave me a chance to talk about the ways in which, you know, the Civil War continues to be uh, debated over, right? I mean, there are central aspects of the war that, that 150 plus years later, you'd think that there would be some kind of consensus around, right? Um, the importance of slavery as a cause of the war, um, the importance uh, that the Confederacy attached to the institution of slavery uh, during the war. Um, and the fact that we're, we're, we're not there yet reflects, I think, just the, the difficulty that we have sort of acknowledging the complexity of the past and also just the, the, the centrality of race and white supremacy in our, in our nation's past. And, and the Black Confederate uh, narrative, you know, is one of the most confusing things because it's, it's such a bizarre story to begin with, this notion that anywhere between, you know, this is embraced by, you know, people who are uh, members of Confederate heritage groups. Uh, these are pe people who tend to be more politically conservative that embrace this narrative, but essentially the argument is that anywhere between 500 and 100,000 uh, black men fought as, uh, as real, real soldiers in the Confederate army between 1861 and 1865. And this often, you know, emerges, this narrative emerges um, for people who are, again, feeling very defensive about constantly being bombarded by the issue of race, or people who are committed to seeing their ancestors who may have fought as a Confederate soldier, um, who, people who are committed to seeing them as having engaged in something honorable or just not wanting to deal with the pain of race and slavery. And so if you want to um, diffuse you know, that argument, that sort of argument that places race and slavery at the center um, when it comes to the Confederacy, the easiest thing to do is to say, well, the Confederacy mobilized thousands of black soldiers, so it could not have been racist. My great great grandfather <laughs> fought next to black men as soldiers. Uh, so he could not have been racist. And, you know, that has a lot of potency to it, right? I mean, it, it sort of speaks to the ways in which we use history to reinforce some present, our, our own assumptions about who we are as Americans um, and our past, right, our collective past. And so it's, a, it, it's actually a fairly recent myth, as far as I can tell, the first references to it, um, we don't see until the 1970s. Um, white Southerners, Confederates during the war were very clear about the place of African Americans in their army. They were uh, first and foremost um, utilized as enslaved labor. The Confederacy did not approve of enlisting black soldiers until the final weeks of the war. Um, none of them saw battle. Maybe a small number were trained, maybe marched through the streets of Richmond in April 65. White Southerners for generations after the war were never confused about um, the place of African Americans in the Confederate war effort. They were always remembered as enslaved labor. Um, they never remembered black soldiers fighting alongside white soldiers. That would have been absurd to them, in fact. Uh, but it's only in the post-civil rights period that white Americans have felt a need to bring up this mythical narrative. And, I, and again, I think it's because um, it comes at a time when the nation's broader collective memory uh, about the Civil War is beginning to shift. We're talking more and more about Black United States soldiers, um, most obviously the men who fought in the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Uh, we're talking about a time beginning in the 1970s where public institutions, museums, historic sites are talking more and more about slavery and emancipation. Textbooks are beginning to change. Um, and for people who are still celebrating their Confederate heritage, this was seen as a threat, right? And the Black Confederate narrative was their way of uh, trying to counter that. So and that's a lot in a very, in, 
in a short span of, span of time. I mean, I, I don't want to just sort of tout the book, but um, there's a lot in there, obviously, to, to digest if people want to learn more. No, I think you should tout the book, and it's called Searching for Black Confederates. Um, I, I know you can get it at Amazon or wherever you buy books at. Um, I, I really strongly suggest you all reading it because I think especially in this day and age when there's so much misinformation or, or deliberate falsities being spread, yeah. this is one of the books that's definitely needed at this point yeah. in time. And I'll just add one more point because um, I think you just raised a really important one. And that is, you know, we're talking, this, this narrative sort of thrives in the age of the internet, right? It's, um, it speaks to the fact that we're not teaching, we're not teaching teachers and we're not teaching our students how to properly assess information online. We're not teaching students how to search and we're not teaching them how to assess uh, the websites that are coming up as a result of um, you know, the, the, the keywords they, they use to search in a search engine. So it's a, it's a huge problem and this is one example of that. Yeah, and one of the things I do wanna uh, bring up too, and it's an adjacent one, it's about education. Um, there was recently, a it's a slight segue. There was a recently op-ed by Arkansas State Senator Com Tom Cotton uh, criticizing the New York Times 1619 project, which was a basically a zine, for lack of a better word, of last year, it came out last year about the 400 years of slavery, uh, starting 400 years ago when the first enslaved Africans came to the United States. Mm -hmm. Tom Cotton and many people of his particular political party and some adjacent to his political party really criticized it for some things that were Minor falsities, minor falsities, but one of the bigger ones was the criticism is that the United States was essentially founded on slavery. And another criticism was that um, slavery was integral to the economy. And in the, in the words of Tom Cotton, not my words, not your words, that slavery was a necessary evil in order to build society. Um, that type of ethos is getting more and more steam by the day online. And so it troubles me because you see a lot of these kind of people who've never read the text, who've never read any historical information. And how does that make you feel now? We have people in prominent positions start saying things that you know aren't necessarily true, but also very, very uh, endangering to the population yeah. as a whole. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there are a couple of ways to respond to this. I think the historian in me wants to first point out um, that there's nothing new about that, right? That, that history, especially American history has always been politicized, right? Um, and so, especially when it comes to the most sensitive areas of our collective past, namely the history of slavery, the history of white supremacy, um, you know, th that, again, that is nothing new. Um, and, and even Cotton, Tom Cotton's um, sort of critique of the 1619 Project uh, follows in a long line of, of, um, of, of criticisms, right? Um, you know, as, as someone, first, I applaud Hannah Nicole Jones for, for the project. A lot of hard work went into that. I think quite often, I think too much attention has been given to the introductory essay, which I thought was a fabulous essay. I certainly uh, agree with the revisions that were announced, the edits that were made to that, because I do think that historians pointed out some issues when it came to that kind of reductionism um, regarding you know, what the revolution was about. But I think what's been lost in all of this is the fact that, uh, that at least the initial unveiling of it included some incredible essays from some wonderful uh, academic historians, including Kevin Cruz, who you mentioned um, you know, in your opening remarks, as well as some other fine pieces by some very talented writers. So there's a lot to chew on, and I've already used it, that project in my own teaching uh, last year, and it worked really well as a way to, and this is where I think the project has, um, you know, is the most helpful, especially for educators, is the way it sort of forces students to begin to rethink how we frame American history, right? Because the, the traditional framing of American history has, has I think, tended to, to, to sort of give uh, a good deal of, of you know, of, of attention to this idea of inevitability, that slavery uh, was, that, that the end of slavery was inevitable, that the march of freedom is always progressive, right? Um, it's always two steps forward. It's, it's rarely two steps forward and one step back, right? Um, and I think that sort of reduces, that, that sort of simplifies American history to the point where I think it becomes 
uh, just almost meaningless and, uh, and not very helpful for understanding where we are today. And unfortunately, I think, you know, Tom Cotton and others, um, you know, they, they found a uh, sort of an in in terms of how to criticize the project because there were some legitimate criticisms at first, right? And, and that's okay, right? Because, you know, look, historians and even writers of, the, of history just writers generally, we always, we're always looking to do better. We're always, we should always be willing to revise, uh, to admit perhaps where, you know, we've gone astray and make corrections. Um, but everything is so politicized these days that um, it's almost impossible to have uh, any kind of rational discourse online, which I'm sure right. you found, right? Uh, that That's a daily thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, a daily thing. And so one of the things I do want to bring up, too, is that you've done something online that I think is interesting. You've done it. It's on your website, but it's also something you keep a, a basically an open ledger at this point on on Twitter, which is just a number of Confederate sites that are being taken down or yeah. removed or put into private storage. Um, what possessed you to do that? Because I think it's really important, but no yeah. one else is really doing that. Yeah. Um, Hillary Green is. Um, I think she's doing a, a much more expansive kind of um, okay. cataloging. And I think hers goes back to, um, I think, to 2015. You know, I decided to do it I mean, because I have a website. Um, so it's, it was easy for me to keep track. But I also think, you know, I was taken by surprise in terms of the speed, the pace at which, you know, the monument started coming down. I wasn't surprised that there was, uh, that, that people started, uh, in the language of today, tagging um, Confederate monuments and other monuments. Um, I, I was surprised in the days after the George Floyd killing, what happened in Richmond. You know, as someone who, I mean, I taught for 11 years in, in nearby Charlottesville, Virginia. I've led tours of Monument Avenue in Richmond. As a historian who's interested in, in memory and con especially Confederate memory, you know, I spent countless hours walking Monument Avenue in Richmond um, and seeing the extent of the tagging, right, or vandalism. Um, I, it, I, it took me time to wrap my head around it all. And then to watch the, the headquarters of the United Daughters of the Confederacy in flames. I mean, I, I, I really couldn't believe what I was looking at. And then to begin to watch them uh, get pulled down right? Uh, Davis in Richmond, a few others in Richmond, and then elsewhere. Um, I, I thought, well, I, I better start just, just to get a sense of, um, you know, what we're looking at, because some monuments came down, you know, after uh, the Dylan Roof uh, murders. More of them came down after Charlottesville, especially New Orleans. New Orleans took down, I thought I had seen it all after New Orleans, uh, or in New Orleans, because they took down four significant confederate um related monuments uh but i don't think we've seen anything on the scale of of what we've already seen this summer um this morning bentonville arkansas removed a monument that brings the total as far as i can tell to 75. uh i think that number is more i mean if you think of the the fact that the vast majority of confederate monuments went up during the jim crow era and you can find online these graphs and you can see the spikes by year, roughly between 1890 and 1930. I don't, I, I think the 75 represents a number that is, that is higher than any number during that period of Confederate monuments going up. Right. Um, so what we've seen is, um, I, I, you know, is, is certainly significant and uh, it'll be interesting to see just how this plays out for the rest of the year. I think we'll continue to see a kind of um, drip over the next few months. I think a lot of people are looking to see what Charlottesville does. Um, <clears throat> I suspect that at some point those monuments, there's um, a Jeff, I'm sorry, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. I suspect that once those come down, uh, we'll see another wave, right? <coughs> Excuse right. me. And so speaking of monuments. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do want to ask you something else, which is the largest Confederate monument in the U.S., uh, Stone Mountain, which is Stone here Mountain. in Atlanta. Yeah. yeah, there's been a renewed push by a lot of people to finally get rid of this monument, and yeah. so there becomes a, a host of questions as to 
to why that would happen or how that would happen, uh, who would do it. But I want to go back for a minute because I think a lot of people aren't really aware of the history of Stone Mountain's monument. And I didn't know if you could speak to that at all because a lot of people just see three old guys on a the wall. They don't really know yeah. who they are. Yeah, that has a long history. I mean, most significantly, it was it was one of the key sites of the um, of, of the um, the new clan that evolved um, in the early 20th century. In what 1915, I think there was a clan mm-hmm. meeting at Stone Mountain. Uh, the, the original plans actually called for a much more extensive engraving uh, on the on the side of that mountain. It was actually supposed to include, I think, hundreds of of Confederate soldiers marching. Um, maybe Lee and Jackson at the front. I don't remember the the initial designs, uh, but there was a delay. I, I don't remember if it was lack of funding, but it wasn't completed until I believe late 1960s, early 1970s. And you know, by that time, it had undergone a a much a, a radical sort of transformation where it was just going to feature uh, Davis, Jackson, and Robert E. Lee. And it's a massive, I mean, I've only been there once. It was a couple of years ago. I, I made it a point to stop by. And it, it really is something else in terms of the scale. You really don't get a sense of um, just the scale of it until you visit. And, you know, it's horrifying. Uh, there's, there's no other way around that. I think what's even more horrifying is the fact that what, what uh, in front of it is essentially an amusement park. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the there, there is, I guess, uh, a company that runs um, uh, sort of a museum, a Stone Mountain Museum, uh, also a landscape that um, where former Confederate states can buy uh, plots of land. They have displays of, of sort of the history of the Confederacy, very lost cause esque uh, that represent their states. And at night there's a, a laser light show. Um, that is projected onto yes. Stone Mountain itself. There were plans a few years ago to uh, to build a new museum, uh, one that sort of highlighted the United States colored troops, the issue of slavery, emancipation. There were plans to actually put up a bell tower of some sort atop Stone Mountain. Because even today, over the, over the past few years, uh, a number of Confederate heritage groups have, have rallied on top of Stone Mountain. You know, it's... This is one of the tougher ones. We're not talking about a statue in the middle of a square that can be easily removed. Uh, we're talking about a, a large scale relief sculpture that you would essentially have to detonate somehow. Right. So, so I, I don't know. I, I don't really have any sense of, of, of what, what's in store for that particular site. And it's so hard to contextualize. I mean, for people who believe that, you know, contextualization is the way to go, that, that, how do you do that? Um, I, I don't even think it's possible uh, to even begin to think along those lines, but um, it's, I, I don't know what's going to happen. It, it's a tough one. Yeah. And for some of the folks at home who don't understand the stone mountain, the carving itself is about the same size as the Statue of Liberty in New York city. Uh, and it sits on a large granite rock. So if you can imagine something that wide, just a carving, and it was actually started by the person who also ended up doing Mount Rushmore. That's right. Yeah. Board so, yeah. Yeah. One of them. And so like, like, like Kevin was saying, the size of it is something you really can't comprehend until you're actually there. Yeah. Um, and, but I mean, within the last 30 days or so, we've had different groups, both protests and counter protest groups descending on Stone Mountain for that very reason. Yeah. And so, like you said, it's because of just what it is, because it sits in the mountain, because it's in a theme park, because it's also a state park that the state purposely contracts out to this park to create a new level of bureaucracy. It's going to be difficult, but that's going to be, I think the bigger thing Because if that was to ever be defaced or if that was to ever be, you know, sandblasted or, or dynamited off, <laughs> I think that'd be a real blow to a lot of people who see that as a source of heritage and history. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like you said, like the park, especially. Um, and so this week you all for the newsletter uh, list readers, you will, get a history of Stone Mountain and that particular park and why that's so complicated. But the other issue is that with Stone Mountain is it, like you said, it is a theme park. It is actually the most um, popular attraction in the state of Georgia. The thing they've done over the last 20 years or so, is just kind of, they've kept the names of Robert E. Lee Boulevard. The, the stat, I mean, the monument is obviously there. They've really in the last 20 years or so, Hershen entertainment has made it a, a family run attraction more and more so, um, but they've downplayed all aspects of it, but they haven't changed the names. They haven't changed the museum about it. Um, 
And so it becomes this issue of like, are you hiding something? Are you just like trying to appease one group and not the other? And so it's super complicated. And that brings me to something else I do want to ask you, which is with all the statues that are coming down this summer, there seems to be a backlash of people bringing down and defacing the statues. And so we really haven't seen this in American history, like the last 90 days or so in a long time. And so the reason I, I asked you this in particular is with all the backlash to all aspects of like the Confederacy right now, do you think that there will be a pushback in the other direction? Um, so good question. I, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I, I, and again, I think this is the historian uh, coming out in me that, that wants to take a step back um, to, and, and, to, and to sort of observe or to say that I think the lost cause, I think that sort of um, for the people who have traditionally embraced this kind of pro-Confederate narrative, this sort of lost cause narrative, I think they've been on the defensive for quite a long time. Um, certainly they have places on the internet where they can gather social media platforms where they can espouse their rhetoric. But in terms of, in terms of their ability to really strike back in a meaningful way, in other words, in a way that utilizes the power of local government, right? Because I think it's important for your, for your listeners to remember that the statues, the monuments, the flags, uh, the Confederate flags that, that, you know, for so long had dominated the Southern landscape, that had the backing of local government. That had the backing of, um, of, of the fact that, you know, local government had tax dollars to sort of maintain this. They had at least the illusion of public support. I think that in the last 20 odd years has dissipated to a significant level in large part because of course our local governments are much more diverse in 2020 than they were just a few decades ago. And I think that's made all the difference. And so I guess what I'm suggesting here is that what we're actually seeing is um, to the extent that certain groups can, um, you know, can engage in a counter protest, it is a, a rear guard action. It is a last ditch effort, right? There is really nothing, the monuments, look, Richmond removed its most important monuments over just in the last few months. The only one remaining is Robert E. Lee. At some point that's gonna come down. The Lee statue, if, if, you're, you know, if you've ever visited Richmond, it towers over this neighborhood. Um, it is uh, it is probably the most important Confederate monument in the entire country, and I'm including Stone Mountain. And that's going to be gone at some point, right? And so that fact, to me, uh, sort of signifies, um, points to a nail in the coffin in all of this. That doesn't mean that people aren't going to be sort of pushing or, or espousing this rhetoric of, you know, the Confederacy was a, was sort of a, a valiant effort, that slavery had nothing to do with the Civil War. Misinformation will continue to be um, shared widely. Um, but in terms of having the power to turn the clock back, I think we're past that point. And I think that's important for, uh, for people to acknowledge, right? I'm not suggesting that we declare victory and all go home. Um, there's certainly a lot of work to be done on a number of different levels. Um, but I think we're seeing something, you know, if you had asked me just 20 years ago whether any of this would have, would have been possible in my lifetime, I would have said you're crazy. I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't even know how to begin to respond, you know, to you um, if you were to ask me that. Um, yeah, I'm just going to leave yeah. it at that. <laughs> no, no. And so uh, before, uh, wrapping up, there is one thing you just wrote recently for The Atlantic, and I just, uh, about um, two months ago now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I just want people to kind of be aware of what you wrote about Richmond because I think it's really interesting. I, yeah, Richmond, again, I am, I've always been fascinated by Richmond. And um, what I wrote was a piece about Monument Avenue. And, and again, this is a, this is a, a boulevard, an avenue in, in Richmond that was established roughly between 1890 and 1930. This is the West End of, of Richmond. And it is a predominantly upscale white neighborhood, has always been. And when that neighborhood was first established, um, part of the planning involved leaving space for public monuments. And that is sort of what gave shape to Monument Avenue. 
Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, uh, Jeb Stewart, and Matthew Fontaine Maury. And what I found that was, you know, just digging a little bit into uh, local Richmond newspapers is that um, when they were, when real estate companies were promoting their lots for sale, they would highlight the monuments themselves, even if they weren't dedicated yet, they would sort of give you a picture of what the neighborhood would look like. You know, you could imagine living in this new neighborhood, brand new home, and in your circle or at your intersection is a monument to Robert E. Lee or Stewart or Jackson. And if you read the fine print in some of these ads, you would see um, the exclusive um, clauses, which basically, um, you know, stated, you know, that uh, these homes were only open for sale to white people. And so I think for me, that drives home the importance of understanding that these monuments are not just passive artifacts. Um, they are still in many, especially the, the ones in public spaces, they are still doing the work of defining space, of, of sort of reminding people of this racialized landscape. Um, the monuments on Monument Avenue from the beginning helped to do the work of segregation. They helped to define who could live where, right? And, and, and that made all the difference for a city like Richmond, which, you know, uh, you know which was, which is still very much um, a segregated city. Right. And so um, I just want to ask you, like in wrapping up, which is, is there anything that you've wanted to explain or mention to people that we haven't talked about already? I think we covered quite a bit. Um, <laughs> it's a, you, you did a good job. Um, no, I think, um, I think we're good. Okay. And I have two more yeah. questions for you. Go for it. Uh, one of which is, You've kind of, you've done this throughout the whole interview, so it's kind of a redundant question, but I asked these last two questions to everyone I interviewed. Um, this question is, what is something about your profession or your work that people misconstrue that you want to correct? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I think I've, and I, I, I think I'm the first person to admit this. I've struggled at times between balancing my role as a historian slash educator and an activist. I don't really consider myself an activist. I, I certainly have opinions about, um, about things related to everything we've talked about today, but I've seen my role primarily as someone, you know, who is trying to explain the past as, as best I can, right? Because, for me as a historian, that is always an ongoing project, right? Trying to deepen um, my understanding, trying to question things I believe, you know, um, considering new evidence, et cetera, all the things that historians do. Um, but, but I guess the misconception is that somehow, um, and I get criticized a lot for this because I sometimes, I guess for certain people, I'm not... I'm not loud enough in denouncing X or calling for X to be removed. And I have sometimes trouble explaining that that's not really my role, on, especially online and absolutely in the classroom, right? I do not engage in trying to proselytize, um, you know, trying to convince my students to believe anything, right? My job is to give them the tools to figure things out on their own as best they can. Okay. And that breaks into my last question, actually, which is a, a definitely a, a bit of an, another turn, but it's the last question I ask everyone, um, and I'm going to ask it to you now, which is, what's making you happy? I think being healthy, um, maintaining my health, you know, try, or try, trying to stay healthy. Um, and to be honest, um, you know, working at home uh, and having my wife at home and being able to spend uh, really quality time with her over the last few months, especially since she's not working um, out of the house. But um, family, um, learning, playing a little guitar when I have the time, right? And, um, and walks with my wife. I try to keep it as simple as possible. Okay. And um, uh, once again, you all, I cannot recommend uh, your work enough. So Kevin Levin, and I keep, I, in my heart, I keep wanting to say Levine. I know that's the wrong way to say it. It's Levin, Levin. Levin. Thank you, Levin. It's like, it's the Southern, I, I'm, I was trying to like get it right. Kevin Levin. You did your best. Right. And so 
Uh, if you if you haven't uh, checked out his books already, you can at his website. Uh, make sure you you, uh, you can go to cwmemory.com slash books to find his books there. Um, I would strongly suggest, especially in this time, if you haven't already, buy it on Amazon, buy it wherever you buy your book set. Um, and once again, you all, thank you so much for tuning into the Neighborhood Watch podcast. If you are reading this week, you are in for a treat. Um, we're going to be talking about the history of the police this week in the United States. So this is a definite treat for the who are readers. Um, if you haven't signed up already, it's iamkingwilliams.substack.com. iamkingwilliams.substack, S-U-B-S-T-A-C-K.com. Thank you once again, Kevin. My pleasure. Great to be with you. All right.